And it's national forests Northwest. all around us, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. All of this is all part of the Tongs National Forest. And as soon as you move up these glaciers, you get into the Juno Ice Field. So. And you guys have a, and this is this, so this is campus so, here. So, so right? here's a, here's a blow up of campus. Okay. Okay. Right? Okay. So this is again. Well, so Auk Lake is right here, and so campus is right here. Okay. And Mendenhall Lake is here, and the Mendenhall Glacier flows into Mendenhall Lake. Gotcha. So it's about a 13 mile long glacier that comes out of the Juno Ice Field. And it's been shrinking a lot. It has been shrinking a lot. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it loses a few hundred feet a year at this point okay. off, off of the toe coming back this way. Okay, cool. So we're here at the Mendenhall Glacier, and Kevin's going to tell us, so what year did you first come here? Uh, I was about 20 years ago, so 1998. Okay. 1999. So there's the glacier over there. And how, how much so, does it change? So the whole left-hand side, is if you look down the ridge line and where it flattens out, right. that was all covered with ice. Wow. And the right-hand side where there's this steep... Um, ridge line that comes down right. that was all covered with ice and that's all receded and um, in 20 years yes yes and, and and when I came here it was actually only receding like maybe sometimes 30 to 50 feet a year and then and then it started looking more like a hundred feet a year and then now it's generally several hundred feet a year Great. And so is that, so do you guys, is that an interpretation? Step back over. <laughs> Step back into the non-rainy time. So when you, when the interpretation happens here and all the tour boat people and everything come here, is that a major discussion item or is it not, you know what I'm saying? Is, I, is I that think, sort of a lead in to I, the... I think they often avoid it. I'm not, I'm really? not exactly sure. I know when I used to, so when we were talking about Brooke's job working with, with helicopter clients. Right. So the other thing is, right, the, the glacier recedes from the front, but it also is thinning, right? So it, lo it loses like six to 12 inches a day off the surface of the ice. Oh my God. As it, as it flows down. Oh my and God. so some of that's meltwater and then a lot of it sublimates, right, as the wind blows across right. it. Right, um, But I used to, to be there and, and talk to, to clients and they'd say like, oh, walking, they start walking around on the glacier causing problems i mean because i chop steps for them in the ice yeah, yeah, and things yeah, like yeah, that yeah. and i would always try to explain them well <laughs> by tomorrow this will all be gone but the fact that we you came here in a cruise ship and Is flew here in a helicopter <laughs> right. and are flying back in a helicopter you're causing far more right right like you know damage to the to the glacier than, than the fact that we're walking around on it and, and then people would get a little bit of like they would often be kind of resistant <laughs> we're chopping the ice That's interesting. And so you're saying that uh, one of the one of the common ecotourism things is people uh, helicopter up to back farther up there on the glacier, and they do walk around. They do dog sled things. Yeah. So there are dog sled camps. If you look just just where the so this glacier is about 13 miles long, okay. before the, and the, the head of the glacier that comes out of the Juno Ice Field, and but but if you go around the next bend that we can't see, there's a um, dog sled camp that sets up in the summer. With, 300 dogs and 300 dogs for all summer yes and, they, um, and then they have their their staff and um, people and, and clients fly in in the helicopter land ride, ride dog sled around the ice field and then come back in and get, get in a helicopter and fly back in in one day in one day yeah cool. and how many people do you think do that roughly in a summer is it like a hundred thousand people that, I'm not. I'm not exactly sure. Yeah, but, 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 but tens of easy. thousands, probably. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, cool study a normal, topic. A normal day, four or five helicopters will land at once. So, I mean, and, and then take off again and right. bring more people up. And so by the second load, they drop the people off, and the other people who got there can come back in the helicopter. So mm -hmm. the helicopters are full. You know, ideally the helicopters are full both ways. Cool. So the, are you, you'd say that this Mendenhall Glacier is a key part of the identity of Juneau, would you say? Or not? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. Absolutely. And anybody who's, who's come to visit Juneau knows the Mendenhall Glacier. Anybody okay. who um, lives here has been to the Mendenhall. Well, well, I mean, that's the other really interesting thing to me is that our students come here within like 
a month or two, they've been on the glacier, they've been around, they've, mm -hmm. they've, they've checked it out. I talk to so many people who live in Juneau who've never, you know, they've never set foot on That's the glacier. It's always the case. It's like, you, like you have to have friends come to town to go see the yeah. museum or whatever. Right? I mean, yeah. yeah, and they've come to see it, but to actually walk on it, you know, you need, you need equipment and you yeah. often need, need some um, training. And then, so to go on it, if you wanted to go on it by yourself, do you need permits from the Forest Service or whatever? Or? No, no, it's all okay. public land, so anybody can just walk out, okay. walk out, camp on it anywhere they want, okay. kind of do whatever they want. But if you want to have a commercial operation, sure. or like for us, we have a permit through the Forest Service. Cool. All right. Mendenhall Glacier. Awesome. Want to go check out the visitor center? Yeah, let's go check out the visitor center. Side. Yeah, yeah. That's where, where my friend's house is. The ones on the other side. Yeah, where they do a lot of work with retaining walls and um, trying to basically keep the mountain from sliding off into their house. So a lot of home hazards, but then the city must have some buildings up here too, right? Like, or, or not really, it's all uh, private I residences. Think, you know, I think all be private residences. So a different kind of coastal erosion than we typically deal with. <laughs> So here we are. So, so this is downtown. So this is the waters of the ocean here. And we're up here, right? We are at the beginning of Perseverance Trail. Oh, okay. So okay. Um, let's see. We came up. We passed the Flume Trail here. We're in here somewhere. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> and, so, and so the Mendenhall is, is over, over there more. Here, here we are. Up at, at the like... We're right, we're right here, okay. where we are. And so if we if we walked from here, we'd walk up and up and up and up and up, and then we get to the other old mine site. By the and so and how many mines shafts are there around? A gazillion or just a handful? The a gazillion. Okay. <laughs> okay. I, I have, yeah, I'm not sure, but so, but they're they're all over. Everybody came and staked their claim and. Well, I mean, what happened or? is there there were a whole bunch of small mines, and then they slowly kind of. Uh -huh. were bought up and there were fewer and fewer larger mines or okay. were bought up by larger mining okay. companies. And I think also as, as more capital was needed to get to the gold, so you know. Right. So there were, there were originally just, there was like gold panning on Gold Creek and then it became digging a shaft and bringing in large equipment. And so where did you say that Sand Beach was? Is that Sand so, Beach down no, over that, here? That's over, away? that's on Douglas Island across oh, okay. the water. Because, Which is over there, over, yeah. down over there. Because because the, the the vein of gold runs down from Mount Robertson and underneath the channel, okay. underneath the water. Okay. So that'll be our next stop. Excellent. What they said is that you could hear Juno as you turned into Gastineau Channel a few miles down there because these ran 24 hours a day, every day. But I'm going to say Christmas and Fourth of July. <laughs> And, and these are crushing rock. They're crushing for rock. For the mining industry. And yeah, and what they did is they built these ditches all along Douglas Island that would divert the water, and the water would come down through the hose. It gets right over here, gets funneled into that. That turns the crank hydraulically, and this, these things crush the rock. Wow. And so this is all that sandy beach you're talking about. Yeah. So this is all. So none of this is actually, and if you walk down here, you'll, it's, it's a long. So uh, a different type is, of sandy beach. High is high. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, oh yeah, wow. Holy cow. Wow. So when the tide goes out, the, the beach is, it extends, you know, a large, out to the, the point, just about in, in sand. Right. And um, I actually moved here and lived here for several months before I realized this wasn't a natural beach. Wow. That's cool. Huge right. Oh, okay. Go, 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 go. So, so huge avalanches come down this path right here. 
and the next one over and they shoot them with a howitzer from over here. Really? Yep. And so when there's scheduled shoot, like when they're going to shoot it, you can find these videos online. If you just put in Juno Avalanche, you'll okay. see giant wet slides, slow moving wet slides that come down and some with actually some faster avalanches that come down and come part way across the channel. And then um, Holy cow. you can go and, you know, the snow is piled 30 feet high, 40 feet high. Oh my God. There. So they shoot a shell into the side of the mountain, basically, or the top of the mountain yeah. where the snow is. Well, and what, what they do, so I have several friends who, who work as avalanche forecasters and avalanche mitigation. The way they used to do it, I actually love this. They would have bundles of dynamite. It looks very cartoonish, <laughs> right? Oh, God, dude. And like one guy, the door's off the helicopter. There's the pilot. There's a guy in the front who's directing where they're going to go. There's the guy who holds the dynamite. And the guy who like basically starts the fuse. Okay. So the guy starts the fuse. The other guy throws the dynamite <laughs> out. And the helicopter flies, and you watch it go. Now what they have is something called a, a daisy bell, which is um, a conical kind of device with an igniter at the top, and it fills up with with um, some kind of fuel mixture, gas, and uh -huh. then they spark it, and it shoots the the explosion down, and they huh. use that for for avalanche mitigation. Wow. So you guys have a huge tourist industry. Yes. So huge yes. tour ships, cr cruise ships come Girl, through. I'll fix my hair a little bit. Yeah, fix your hair, dude. Yeah, yeah. You look very unprofessional. <laughs> and so, so, the, so that I, I would say the biggest, so, so we're, we're in the, the um, Tongass National Forest. So most of the land is managed by the Forest Service. Right. And when the Forest Service um, ranges an end, the, the permit administrators tell me is that for all of the U.S., this is like the hot spot for anybody who wants to do recreation and tourism management. Because huh. in the summer we get over a million visitors. In the winter, there there aren't that many people that live here, but they're so concentrated in, in, in this one area, um, and there's so many people vying for permits and so many people doing so many different things. So there's everything from from hunting permits, right? right. So guided hunting trips right. happen here. Um, and those involve doll sheep and like brown bears and black bears. And, and then there's commercial fishing. I guess the, the Forest Service doesn't actually manage commercial fishing. But, um, but the cruise ships come in and there's lots of helicopters. Lots the of helicopters go into the glacier up there. Helicopters go to the glacier. They also go, I mean, they go, so the, the whole ice field, right? So there's this, this 1500 square mile ice field and then um, most of them have different sites and the sites will bring up I was mentioning earlier up to like seven helicopters at a time will be flying to the site dropping some people off picking other people up and so it's noisy here in the summer and, and so there are people looking for a wilderness type experience but there's a lot of, of helicopter traffic there's also a lot of fixed wing traffic um, so people do flight seeing and fixed wing. So, so flight seeing from both the airport and also seaplanes as well. Right? Yes, exactly, yeah, okay, right. exactly. So seaplanes from downtown Juneau, and and then there are some lodges that that um, just south of, of Juneau, the Taku River comes out of the Taku Glacier, and um, so so one of the things that people do is get on um, a float plane and fly to Taku Lodge and have a salmon bake. And there are bears all over there. I mean, I mean, bears like when when I've been there, they're shooing the bears away using um, basically like broom handles, <laughs> right? And um, and the bears come in, they take the salmon off the grill, they walk away from the grill, and the bears are licking the grill. And, nice. Um, so anyway, so so yeah, there's there are over a million tourists that come here, and they and they and then in the winter time, there's less tourism, but something that's that the community has been trying to build for a long time, so they're trying to manage that. So skiing type stuff. Exactly. Backcountry exactly. type stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's the issue. Like, what do you do with all these people? Especially when what, they're, what, what all of them want is some kind of... Um, authentic experience. Authentic wilderness experience. Right. But there are millions of them in the same place at the same right. time. Right. And so most of the, we say most of the people here, well, so, the, so this is also the capital of the state. So you have uh -huh. political 
jobs and government uh, uh, infrastructure kind of running the techno technocrats of the exactly. government. I mean, that, that's still the main okay. economic base okay. in Gina. And then, and so there's there's um, government work. There's mining. Uh, there, there's a few large mines in the area. There's fishing, and then there's tourism. And, and one of the things commercial they, fishing. Commercial fishing, right? Yeah. yeah. And they're mostly taking salmon, halibut, cod down here. Uh, black cod. Black cod, is, okay. Is uh, and they and black cod, or or it's sable fish. Sometimes people refer okay. to as they, they yep, live yep, yep, really yep. deep and they fish for them in pots. Um, and then uh, crustaceans too, crabs and stuff. Crab, uh huh. Mm -hmm. And but the crab fishery here has really suffered lately. And, and oh, really? From what? Um, I. Th I think there there are disputes about this. Uh, some people say because sea otters, their, their sea otter population is growing and eating the crab. Other uh -huh. people um, think that it's perhaps overfishing. I mean, one one of the things about Alaska is that, that Alaska has done really well. I think has been to manage its fishing industries, and so so to really try to keep them sustainable. Mm -hmm. Although mainly that's been done just by you know counting the number of fish caught and, and you know trying trying not to overfish I think mean, that's becoming a lot more complicated with climate change right and um, so people are, are less certain but um, of, of what what's causing problems but but people are catching fewer crab than they used to catch it. and we've been talking about there's been a resurgence of as we've seen in other places like in Hawaii and elsewhere sort of resurgence in Native people's cultural identity yes. and trying to exert more, have more of a say in resource management issues and the coastline stuff, and and so that's happening here too. Absolutely, and and I, I think maybe in a, in a slightly different way, just because um, because the way Alaska is is organized with Alaska Native groups um, because of the um, Native land claims. Settlement Act, um, corporations, native corporations were set up, and so and that for, was in the seventies, right? Yes, native corporations. So, so we actually have a class that that um, one of our Alaska Native um, Studies faculty teaches uh, with Glenn Wright, political science uh -huh. faculty uh -huh. who you met um, that, that looks specifically at that process and how that happened and, and what's going on. But some of the, but my understanding is that that. Um, Alaska, the, the Alaska Native corporations um, are really becoming the most powerful economic force in the state. And so unlike other places where, um, along with kind of cultural devastation, there's not a lot of economic right. um, where power. Well. Alaska's not really set up that way. Alaska is definitely a state that, that appears, it appears in the future Alaska Native um, corporations are going to have or both power. political and financial power, yeah. And I think that's that's it's going to be interesting to see how it works. So out. we've seen that in some areas of California, for example. So it's not, we we don't have the corporation uh, tradition that you guys have, but but uh, legalized gambling. And ah, so yes. Uh -huh. Native American casinos in areas that are that I would say most of them would would be fairly it's fair to say we're you know um, economically depressed and tough times. These these. Uh, casinos come in and they are the big not only the big employer but also they're beginning to exert influence on you know county planning yes, exactly. issues exactly. and all kinds of stuff like that and and uh, it's been very interesting to watch that because now that the, the native people start to have power there's not as many people are, are as supportive as they were before they when they had no power so it's it's a lot of interest for, for example one of uh, one of the Chumash casinos near us in Santa Barbara County, they um, essentially now pay for the local fire department, and they pay uh -huh. for the lo uh, this local uh, uh, aspects that used to be taken care of by the county level government are now being essentially wholly supported by the um, the native money, and they would like some more say sometimes of where yeah. the station oh, yeah. goes or or whatever the case may be. And then, and, and here, I mean, one of one of I think the the crisis issues, issues in terms of Alaska Native cultures is language because right. there are fewer and fewer native speakers of Alaska languages. Um, but 
but there is there are still enough la- native speakers that, that so for example at, at UAS there's a, a really big push to, to do more and more research and document more and more um, vocabulary uh, and yeah, terminology vocabulary, and, exactly. and place names I mean place names are, are, are really significant and so that's something that and by the way this is a, that's a department that does a lot of the thing that you were talking about where students are doing research right. and meeting with elders and, right um, yeah and, and we're working on that with some on Santa Rosa Island with some uh, traditional Chumash speakers to you know what's the name of this place and what, what do you yeah. call this landform and that kind of stuff so that's cool so the other thing is um, here in Alaska that people might not might understand but might not is um, how often a regular Joe Blow person not necessarily a commercial fisherman or whatever everybody or a high proportion of people hunt fish recreate outdoors and stuff yes Yes, and, and and I think in Juno that's that's probably especially or, or more true than it is, for example, in Anchorage, right? Which is has a little. I mean, Juno is still. I wouldn't call it an, an, an urban center, but most people get most of their food at Costco and right. you know, Fred right. Meyer Safeway, like a normal grocery store that you, you you would think of. But it's still part of the local identity and culture. I think. That So you can tell when the hunting season opens because everybody's sort of not around for the first week or two. Yes, or I have students who come and say, um, <laughs> I can't be to my lecture. Kevin, I can't, yeah, I can't either because I'm, I'm going to go to, um, I just had a student who was going to Admiralty Island across the water to spend a few days. And, and, and I think that's that's actually an important thing for students to do, who right. to do it. So. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Cool. So then, uh, so we talked about there's there's some erosion issues with some of the town that's built very close. Uh, there's There's sediment issues in the wake of the mining, uh, historic mining activity here. Fishing, tourism. Um, there's also water pollution issues. Water pollution, I mean, okay. One of, the, okay. one of the big deals with cruise ships, uh-huh. it's been a huge controversy lately, has been um, the dumping wastewater of, dumping. Uh-huh. Yep. dumping. And, and, yep. and, and cruise ships have, have, I think, I mean, I think the cruise industry, as far as I can tell, is trying to upgrade their their own like wastewater treatment. Right, right. Uh, things on ship, but it seems like they can't really, with the growth of the industry, they can't keep up. Yeah, that's really, really difficult. So, so they when they pull up to shore, do they, do they like offload? Do they pump their bilges and stuff like that into municipal? Uh, that's a good question. Thing. I'm not exactly sure what their okay. process is. Okay. But but I do, and I have um, students who both worked for environmental consulting companies, who worked for the mines and for the cruise industry. Doing water testing. Um, interesting, I, but I'm not exactly sure. What they no, no, but that's, yeah, a, that's yeah. a really interesting uh, aspect. But, but I, mean, I know, I know, with, with dumping of just wholesale physical trash, that they got a huge black eye, and the industry is sort of reformed in terms of how they handle yeah, that. But yeah, but yeah I'm, not, I'm also unclear as to the. Uh, but it's also, I mean, water. You know, the, a, so. it's pretty standard, and one of the, the local pushes have been because everybody who lives in. Lots of people live on boats in harbors here. Uh huh. Like stand, forest. Yeah, like forest. And standard practice has just been to like dump your waste over the side. Wow, that's legal. Well, not exactly. <laughs> but not exactly monitored or. And it's been like okay. for, for a long time. It's yeah. Everybody that I know who's on boats and stuff. That's that's kind of and, and so there's been a really big push and, and media campaign lately to um, instead of doing that to. Um, Use the head on the boat and then have it like mm-hmm. have it pumped. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, that's been very recent. But and and it's really and you know in a lot of communities. But I just pointed it. It was fairly recently, you know, relatively recently that that um, even communities around here stopped just piping their their waste into the water into, into the ocean and mm-hmm. just letting it go. So. So a lot of people for heat, so one of your guys' most abundant resources is obviously your timber and wood. So a lot of people use pellet stoves, right, for heat? Well, they do, but what's becoming more and more popular here are um, kind of heat pump type stoves. So there's a hydroelectric plant just south of Juno. Uh-huh. And, and electricity in Juno is very cheap compared to ah. most rural areas. That's why some people have electrical so, heating. So my, so for ah. example, so my, 
my own personal house, when I bought it, had a Toyo stove, so it was heated with, with you know, like heating fuel, uh -huh. and a, you know, basically a kerosene stove, a vented kerosene stove. And, um, but we switched it over to um, a yeah, more efficient electric heat pump type system. Cool. And so, so okay, so, so you guys got abundant hydroelectric energy. You guys have a reservoir above town that supplies most of water. Uh huh. And where's the municipal treatment facility? Is that behind us? The water treatment facility? Sewage plant? That's really funny because one of my friends was in fact the head engineer of that plant, and I'm trying to remember where it is. Um, oh, but it's, it's close by. It's yeah, close by. yeah, 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 yeah. And and so okay, so we got that going on, and then I think the last thing, since we're at the airport, and I'm interviewing Kevin as we're driving to the airport. So I think the last thing is how important the. So we talked about a little bit in terms of the hunting and fishing and stuff, but the cultural identity of natural resources is really baked into the, the culture much more so here than in other places I would say oh yeah, yeah so I mean, salmon there's a salmon ballot a salmon initiative on the ballot right now and 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 one of the ways that Juneau actually differs from or Southeast Alaska differs from the rest of the state is that um, so many people here work in commercial fishing mm -hmm. and either they work here in commercial fishing or they travel elsewhere in Alaska to commercial fish but very few people work in the oil industry here and in the Aha. rest of Alaska that's just not the case right and right. so when it comes to um, or or and and people work in mining but but I think fishing um, yeah and people are really concerned concerns with mines mm -hmm. often have to do with destroying um, places that have, have been um, fish producing areas. streams and yeah, yeah. yeah. so yeah. so that's the kind of um, that's often a political conflict where, where Southeast Alaska ends up opposing what a lot of people in the northern and Alaska. south central Alaska mm -hmm. want to do. Cool. All right. That's a little bit about okay. coastal management from Kevin. Thanks. Crying from okay. uh, University of Alaska Southeast. Awesome. Thanks, dude. You're welcome. Yeah.